the ninth CISA YPF Sustainability in Bezo. My name is Renee Peterson and I will be your facilitator for the first session. Yesterday we had a great session where we heard talks on leadership management, leadership and management in the first session um, with an intense Q&A. Um, the next session was led by Neelam cover, cover, covering the roles of engineering and engineering in reducing inequality in South Africa. We ended the day off with a question and answer session and we had quite a few questions. Um, so just on that note, all the presentations and questions will, and answers will be available on the CISA website um, after the Inviso. So if you would like to revisit any of the talks that you found interesting or maybe ones that you've missed, um, they will be available. Um, the session was recorded as well and I'm sure that the recordings will be available too. Um, for today, we will be having a session on leadership, work-life balance, and workplace humility. Um, each speaker will speak for 15 minutes, and our keynote speaker will be speaking on bringing humanity into the workplace. Um, before we hand over to the speakers, I would like to thank our sponsors, um, Aeon, MedTech Engineers, and Sky Civil and Structural Engineers. To kick off our morning, we have Refilwe Lediha. Refilwe studied civil engineering at the University of Johannesburg and later went on to complete a master's degree in engineering. He has previously served as the chair of the South African Institute of Civil Engineering in Johannesburg, and has also served in the National Executive Council of the National Society of Black Engineers. He is currently the National Chairperson of the Black Business Council in the built environment. His experience includes working as an engineer for Group 5 and various engineering consulting companies. He is currently a full-time entrepreneur and founder of VTV Group, and 3D Printcrete and Robotics. He has written numerous academic conference papers at international conferences and is completing his PhD in engineering, focusing on artificial intelligence and robotic systems with sustainable material and material technologies. Do you feel where the floor is yours? Okay, um, thank you very much, Rini. And uh, a very good morning to, to everyone that's joining us today. As I learned by Rene, I'll be speaking on work-life balance from a young professional point of view. You know, one is um, accustomed to making very hard and technical presentations, so it is very refreshing, you know, to be invited to speak on this very important matter. So, so when I told my wife that I'll be speaking on work-life balance, you know, she laughed, you know, stating that um, I'm the last person to speak on this matter. So that was, you know, really just interesting feedback. Um, um, I've done a, lot, a bit of research on this, on, on this topic and then, you know, also applied my, my mind, you know, and one um, thing that people or one sort of like baseline I get is that, you know, the topic is really a very subjective topic. You know, if you speak to three different people, they'll probably give you three different versions of what life, work-life balance is. But I've, I've just outlined or broken it down to, you know, three that make uh, impact or, or resemble with me. There's, um, um, you know, one of, uh, you know, the greatest, you know, motivational speakers called Zig Zegler. He said that you can't truly be considered successful in your business life if your home life is in shambles. So, so his perspective was more, you know, family centric and so forth. Then um, another interesting one was from Hillary Clinton, who said that don't confuse your career life. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, what to say this? So she says that don't confuse having a career with having a life, right? So she speaks about, I guess, you know, you know um, uh, more of the balance with regards to, for example, you know, leaving work late and then, you know, having to go home to, you know, a house that, you know, doesn't have anyone, or you know, having found children, you know, sleeping and having missed very critical milestones from a family point of view. But um, um, a more frank definition, you know, was from 
the former CEO of General Electric, who's called Jack Welch, who says that there's no such thing as work-life balance. You know, there are work-life choices and you make them and they have consequences. So um, in summary, these are three varied views, you know, from the three different individuals. But then one, what one picks up is that um, at the end of the day, it's based on it's based on the choices that you make, and I guess the priorities one tends to, uh, you know, put forward. Now, I think that there's an interesting interesting perspective as well. You know, this is by Peter Lynch, who is a Wall Street investment banker. You know, who said that I don't know anyone who said on their deathbed, "Geez, I wish I'd spend more time at the office." You know, and I think this this quote expresses the concept quite succinctly, you know, that sometimes, you know, work-life balance could be, you know, seen or understood better in retrospect than, you know, later on in your life. So, you know, to review some of the regrets and to want some of the things that one thinks they could have done better. And that, um, unfortunately, sometimes we come to this realization only later and at the tail end of our lives. Now, you know, if you Google and, you know, speak to people, you know, there are a lot of strategies and, and tools that um, people would propose and suggest to, you know, have a strong or, or, you know, a more balanced life. And I've just basically managed to bring them, bring them down to three, you know, key aspects, at least from my perspective. That uh, number one, that, you know, one, lets to, lets, one needs to learn how to get this goal. You know, um, when somebody, when I was a bit younger in my 20s, I used to get involved in so many things, you know, you know, whether it's business initiatives and voluntary associations such as this. But then, you know, I've learned to let some of them go so that there's some sort of balance, you know, within my, you know, within my life. But then um, I guess another obvious one is, is for one to really prioritize the time and decide, you know, which activities that one needs to get involved in. And um, and I think the state one is also important, right? That establishing uh, boundaries at work and really sticking to them. And from my experience, I've learned that if you are able to be productive and produce work on time, people tend to, you know, respect boundaries and so forth. And I just think that that's a key aspect of work balance, work life balance as well. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite business executives and um, very accomplished, you know, business, um, you know, entrepreneurs, for lack of a better word who said that it's only by saying no that you can concentrate on the things that really matter. You know, um, Steve Jobs also realized this, I guess, at the tail end of his life, after being diagnosed with cancer, you know, you're just reflecting whether he could have spent, you know, more time with family, more time with his, you know, with his children, or, you know, was it worthwhile, you know, at building such a big corporation and the most valuable, you know, company uh, in the world. Now, um, I just thought I'd, I'd put three pointers from a personal point of view and just really where I am in my life right now. You know, um, one has decided then at this stage to, to take more purposeful projects and activities, right? Um, um, and, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, not just not take on everything, not take on everything and uh, just really bring it down, wide, wide it down to, you know, projects that I feel that are uh, are purposeful and whose vision and mission statements I agree with. Then um, the other thing is, is, is spaces where I feel that I can make an impact, right? Uh, I've decided to take on the role as, you know, of leading the national structure of, of BBCBE because I felt that it's a question, I felt that it's a space, you know, where I can make an impact and really move the needle. Then um, as a full-time entrepreneur as well, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a topic that I still struggle with you know, because um, at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, you need to be very sales driven. So, so saying no to, um, you know, organizations or, you know, you know, platforms where you can network and, uh, you know, generate sales, for example, become very critical because you still have, you know, uh, those expenses at the end of the month. So, so that's the, that's, that's, that, that, that's a very, you know, um, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, the aspect of my life that I'm still struggling with from my work life balance point of view. Now, um, program director, um, this will be my last slide. And I just think it's a very important one, right? That says, um, begin with the end in mind, 
right? This is um, you know, um, a statement by Stephen Covey who wrote, you know, habits of highly successful people. You know that it's important to just you know um, and look at where uh, how you plan to structure life and then look at it retrospectively. You know, I think one of the advantages that we have as young people is that we have people to emulate, and we have you know uh, we're privy to people that have gone through this journey, and then you know then the key lessons to learn and our our position then is to decide whether to emulate them or not. You know, and also from a from ones that have made obviously. Um, or have made decisions that they regret, you know, decide whether we want to go through that part and through the same journey. So the key thing here, um, you know, program director, is that um, uh, it's to begin with the with the end in mind. And um, yeah, that's my presentation, and that's that um, I want to speak about today. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rifilwe. Thank you for that. Um, I think that it was very important to mention the three key aspects, which was learn to let go, prioritize your time and establish boundaries. As we've been working from home, these things have been critical in, um, in a work-life balance. So next up, we have Rifilwe Putelezi. Rifilwe holds a B.Eng. and an M.Eng. degree from the University of Johannesburg and an M.B.L. degree from UNISA. She has over a decade of technical experience shared within, within the power and water utility environment and with varying roles ranging from being an asset manage, manager, substation designer and maintenance engineer for, to being a senior manager responsible for strategic asset management and master planning. She's a professional engineer and is currently a member of the council at EXA and SICE. She is also a member of the Institute of Directors, South Africa. Rifilwe is a winner of the Keith Plowden Young Engineer Achiever Award in 2013. The award is conferred annually by the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. Empowerment is a great passion of hers. This is attested to by the role she recently played as a director of Fuscani STEM Foundation, a nonprofit organization at as she co-founded with intent to promote science, technology, engineering, and math subjects at school through the program. Rufiwe will be speaking to us about her life, hashtag engineering my life story. Rufiwe, thank you. Thank you very much uh, and good morning. Um, it really is an honor um, um, to, to actually be here with you today and to address you and to share with you a little bit about who I am and um, my life as an engineer. Um, the one thing I'll start off with is that I never dreamt of being an engineer throughout my high school career. So that was not one of the things that I always thought I would, I would be. In fact, um, I had always prepared myself to being a, a, a medical doctor all the way through to matric, where I applied for um, um, my, my uh, um, degree. And, um, you know, as, as you apply for being uh, in the medical field, you need to indicate that uh, and illustrate that you've prepared uh, um, um, certain portfolios of evidence, you know, and that one uh, would be either you've done first aid throughout high school where it was allowed um, and also voluntary work at the hospital. So um, I had then done my voluntary work at Garden City Hospital for my June holidays and I did not like it. Not one bit. Came back, uh, went to my high school principal and said, I cannot do medicine, it's not for me. Um, it was traumatizing. I couldn't look at my dad because of the things I needed to do there at the hospital. Um, I love the, the, the concept of being a doctor, but not in medicine. I cannot do it. So the next best option for me was, okay, if there's something called engineering, go find out about it. Um, and we could see what uh, uh, bursaries we can then obtain for you. And that is where it started. Um, I did not like technical drawing. I actually struggled to see 3D. It's something that I had to teach myself. I struggled with that. Um, but ultimately, I am a proud engineer, I am good at what I do, and I'm happy that I took this journey, you know, I am very passionate about solving problems. So 
Um, and that was where it began for me. Um, and, and when we move on then to my high, uh, university journey, um, initially I wanted to do engineering with IT. I, I enrolled at Rao and they had a program called Electrical Engineering with IT which in retrospect, I think is such a brilliant program uh, if you look at what's happening today in the industry. However, I hated IT. Um, so my first year I enrolled in engineering with IT and I, I struggled with the IT part of it. Um, and, and lucky for me, I, I, I am not shy to knock on a door, whether it's to the Dean's office to actually complain and show my frustration or negotiate changing my career. So I uh, spoke to my parents, um, my bursary was for a mechanical engineer and I told them technical drawing is not for me. I'm not gonna draw a car, I'm not gonna fix the car, I'm not, it's not for me. Uh, and bear in mind, this is with the lack of uh, understanding of what exactly all of this entails because I've been planning to being a doctor. Therefore I needed to adjust and, 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 and uh, adapt uh, very quickly. So the next best thing for me was, okay, electrical engineering without IT, it doesn't matter if I lost a year because I started with IT, I will do it and I will make sure that I do my best in it. So um, the university allowed, I was very close with the Dean at that time because I bothered him a lot. Uh, and, and me bothering him is, is also because I was trying to figure out this journey that I'm on as an engineer and, and making sure that I don't just accept what the university prescribes as a first year or second year student, but I engage the office and, and, and whether they liked it or they didn't like it at that time, that was who I am. And I would knock because I needed clarity. And, and I was very fortunate that in me bothering him and me being that test to him, we became very close friends. And, and, and he became one of the people that I, I regarded very closely, um, even throughout uh, uh, my, my first year in, in, um, in employment. Um, so I finished my, my, my uh, undergrad at, at UJ, and then I started um, um, work with ESCOM, as ESCOM then gave me a bursary in my third year. Um, for the electrical engineering and I was a bursary student with ESCOM. So I started then my engineering training program with ESCOM. And um, um, even with that, um, I was always a person who, would, who was inquisitive, a person who wanted to know more. So even with HR wanting to give me a training program that says this is what you need to do in the next 18 months before you are then appointed officially as a, an engineer here at ESCOM, I had my own ambitions. So one of which was I wanted to understand transformers. I wanted to specialize in transformers at that time. So I then engaged the HR office and I requested to have an additional three months spent at Realtek. This is something that ESCOM did not do at that time. And, and, um, and with my request, they then had to, they offered, they allowed um, me to go to Rotec. So for three months, I was working at Rotec uh, and, um, and I, was, I was servicing transformers just like uh, technicians would. Um, uh, I even went into a transformer at that time because I wanted to make sure that I do not shortchange myself throughout my training program. I wanted to get my hands dirty. I wanted to understand the foundation before I could go and say, now I'm designing transformers for ESCOM and now I'm the, I'm the specialist in, in, in substations and transformers. So I, I made sure that um, I got my hands dirty throughout my training program. I was appointed within 12 months, not even 18 months. I think it's perhaps because of my uh, 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 passion and determination and it showed. Um, and I was the substation engineer at, um, at ESCOM distribution. And, um, and, I, and it's a job that I really loved. Um, it, it, it exposed me to a lot of, 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 of issues within the, the transformer and the electrical space and the substation space. I designed a few uh, substations within that space. And uh, soon after I, I achieved my professional registration uh, um, status with EXA, I was then seconded to a task team that was assisting uh, ESCOM with asset management. Uh, and ESCOM was looking into ensuring that they are now aligning with 
then the PES 55,000, which is today ISO 55,000. And, and I was very honored to have been seconded into that group because um, it meant that you know, there was confidence in the character that I was and in my capabilities within the, the engineering space. Um, we rolled out the project, which led to another secondment to group capital, whereby I was in monitoring and evaluation. Um, and um, in that space, I, I spent a few years in there um, um, assisting with the bulk projects until I was seconded again to group technology. Uh, and, and I'm mentioning the secondments because it, some of times it, it, it does not come because I'm, I've applied for it, but it comes because uh, um, the performance shows. Uh, it comes because the determination shows. It comes because um, the value add is evident. So I was then seconded to group technology at within ESCOM, um, and I was then leading the, the maintenance base for the electrical assets. Um, and this is now throughout the group technology space, and which then led to me then officially applying for a position at the substation power station. Um, moving from head office to power station was a move that a lot of people couldn't understand. Uh, and because often you'd find that you start at the power station and you move your way up to, to, to head office and whereby you're no longer now going into the, the core operation part of things. However, for me at that time, it meant um, I cannot be uh, at, at such an early stage, this is before I even reached 10 years of experience within ESCOM and I'm already at head office. I needed to have hands-on experience of what is actually happening at the power station. I cannot be prescribing what the guys at the engineers at power stations must do with the design base, whereby I have not been there and I do not understand and appreciate the challenges that they're facing. So, so the move to the power station as the design base uh, manager um, was purely to make sure that when I then move back to corporate, I can safely say I've walked the talk. I know what I'm talking about. Um, so I traveled for two years all the way from my home to the power station. I was based at Letabo power station and I worked at the power station every single day and I appreciated the challenges that uh, uh, um, the power station team uh, and the managers have in, the, in that space. And I appreciated what the, 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 their limitations were, you know, because if you're sitting at head office and you're saying the standard says this, you have no idea what the limitations are or maybe you do not appreciate them. But after having been there, I knew exactly what I was talking about. Uh, and, and at that time, I was then fortunate enough, or if I would say fortunate, because then it allowed me to diversify my portfolio into the public sector, but I was headhunted and uh, um, approached by Rainwater to join their team as the, the OT manager. Um, and, and that is then when I left Rand, uh, ESCOM to joining Rendwater, which is where I have been. And I have been uh, uh, working in different uh, positions from being senior manager assets um, to being the executive, acting executive and uh, manager in the office of the COO. And, and it has been really a, 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 an eye opener, a, a wonderful experience to have been part of these two entities that are joining the whole water and the, and, and the, and the, and the power nexus in, in this country and the challenges that we're facing. I'm proud to actually be, be one of those engineers who have been contributing in, in, that, in that space. So when it comes to, to, to my career, um, um, and that is the picture that, that it, it looked like. Um, throughout my career, I continued to, to self-cultivate. I studied my master's in engineering uh, um, um, with UJ. I then went on and I studied my master's in business leadership with uh, UNISA. Um, I, I, I completed an executive coaching program um, and um, um, now currently pursuing my, 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 my uh, career as a, as a non-executive director with the IODSA. And, um, and I must say it has been amazing. It has been tremendous learning outside of um, um, what my profession is. You know, uh, having a mentor uh, from different industries that allow me to, to understand 
uh, a how to deal with areas that and to make decisions with in, in, in areas whereby I'm not an expert. So, so the coaching assisted me with that. Uh, the mentoring assisted me with that. I've got mentors from all over. I never stop uh, obtaining mentors. Um, it's something that I strongly believe in. And I also don't stop mentoring others because um, um, I've got to lift as I rise. And I've got to also understand that um, I wouldn't want the next best person to make similar mistakes without being guided. You know, I've got, I've got experience. I've, I've had my fingers burned. Uh, I've made good choices. But I mean, if, if I don't share my stories with, with anybody, um, um, then I, I, I keep this knowledge within. And, and, and I don't think that's, that's the right way of doing it if we want to transform the space that we are in. Um, when it comes to my non-director, uh, non-executive director positions, I've been a council member with the with the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers from 2013 to date. I've held various chairmanship positions, and and that was important because it it forms part of the networking in the space of engineering. Um, 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 I often say, as an engineer, you do not box yourself, you do not limit yourself. So you need to make sure that you keep your network growing. You need to make sure that you learn from different engineers and different age groups, you know, different experience levels. Uh, I, I keep the gray hairs very close to me. So, so because that's, that's wisdom, right? And it's wisdom that I need to understand that I may not have in the ex number of years experience that I have, but I will only learn from the people that have been around. So, so, so that is very important for me. I do not disregard anybody's experience because that is a lesson that I learned from, from that. Um, I am currently the vice president of EXA, the Engineering Council of South Africa, and recently appointed chairperson for the Val University of Technology. Um, and when it comes to entrepreneurship, um, um, I am also an entrepreneur and, and it's in spirit and it's in my actions, you know. I appreciated what my, uh, my, the, the previous speaker, Rifilwe uh, Bizo, um, what he said about um, um, his wife's comment about, are you really going to be talking about work-life balance? Because you, you might not be the best person to do that. I, it's the same thing I told Godfather, Godfrey. Um, I felt, Godfrey, I do not think I'm the best person to talk about this topic because uh, I'm struggling. Uh, it's, it's work in progress. But uh, um, it's, we, we're moving forward with it. We're learning as we go. And, and even though uh, COVID really was a devastating period in our lives, uh, a part of me is also very thankful for it because it really showed me a side to what a, a quality of life is. Um, I'm working from home, being with my family. Uh, I've never experienced this and I never thought I would have experienced such work life and, and a quality of living that I'm experiencing now with, 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 with working from home. And I think uh, it's, it's something that we need to be agile with in terms of organizations in this country and adapt to it. Uh, um, it, it, it does help and it, it does really give that, that work-life balance um, um, in a way controlled uh, because sometimes you can work all day without noticing it as well. Um, so when it comes to the entrepreneurial side uh, and being an engineer, wanting to solve the issues that we have in our country and, and wanting to ensure that, you know, somehow we promote sustainability. Uh, my sisters and I went and uh, we, 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 we launched and we, we opened a shop that is a zero waste uh, grocer, really nothing to do with engineering, but it's solving a problem that as the world we are facing, a sustainability problem. So we're promoting a, a, a zero waste shopping, we're promoting packaged free shopping, we're promoting uh, uh, minimizing, you know, plastic where people come into our store and they, they come with their containers or they, they are Tupperwares and they buy and we sell, we, we sell whole, food, whole, whole foods, right? Uh, we sell whole foods and we measure, um, we weigh it, they pay and they're out, you know? So, so we're getting customers accustomed to and we're changing this this concept of you know this plastic free uh, 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 lifestyle where you live your life loved you know and that's the name of the the, the concept it's you live 
loved lifestyle. So, so that is in the entrepreneurial side where you want to also balance your lifestyle with, with the solutions that we have and it's, you're changing it one person at a time to ensure sustainability of, of this world that we're living in. So on the entrepreneurial side, that's one of the, the, the things I'd like to share with you because that is important because as an engineer, I never thought I would be selling food. Uh, and nuts and talking about seeds but but when I think about it it's it's it comes back to saying reinvent yourself unbox yourself allow yourself to explore and all the possibilities that are around us and that's those are the skills that as engineers um we need to always remember you know so on Monday to Friday, I'm busy in the boardroom. I'm busy with my non-executive directorship roles. Uh, after hours, on weekends, I'm at the shop and I'm selling. Uh, and, and it's lessons that I'm also trying to impart to my own children, you know, to think out of the box. Um, just because you're an engineer doesn't mean you cannot sell nuts uh, and, and drive a concept that is changing the world and changing the way that we do things. And, 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 and that for me is something that really I'm passionate about uh, outside of the space of engineering. Um, when it comes to giving back, uh, as, as, as our, our co-host Renee mentioned, uh, Fushani, Renee, it's, it's called Fushani. <laughs> uh, and, and we started a, a non-executive, um, um, an NPO, um, um, a company called Fushani. And what we do with Fushani is we really promoting and we assisting high school students who are passionate with uh, are doing STEM subjects. So we do that through uh, tutoring. So we have about five schools that uh, had been adopted and each school has a number of tutors that go to those schools every weekend and we provide tutoring for grade 10, 11, 12 for all STEM subjects. Um, and, and it has been existing for the past six months, I mean, six years. Uh, and, and it has been really great to see the, the, the learners change their attitude towards, towards uh, STEM subjects. It's really been great to see their marks improve beyond the 35% that we, we know of here in our country. But for learners to want more, you know, uh, we, we, we provide uh, tours during the year. So we provide activities such as spelling bee competition where they are part of the national spelling bee competition that's provided by the Department of Education. We take them to the, 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 the events that ESCOM would, would plan for, for young learners to do some competition when it comes to science and technology. We take them to the UJ lab so that they can explore some things there. We take them to science bo science bono so that they can also be exposed because a lot of the kids in the schools that we, 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 we prom adopt don't have the exposure. Therefore, they don't know what they don't know. We need to create that exposure for them so that they can understand what opportunities are out there. So that is a, 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 a company that I'm really, really passionate about. Um, I will leave you with, with the following. I think it's very important. I see Renee is, is connecting back now. One of my mentors, um, and, and I had this mentor early in my, in my career, um, and uh, Babu Dumisani left me with a, a, a imparting book that's called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel. And in that book, it says that you need to be impeccable with your word. Be impeccable with your word in everything that you do. The second thing is do not take anything personal. Uh, um, because I've got 15 minutes, I cannot tell you about the things I've been through. And without the lessons from this book, I would have probably failed at a lot of things. But I remembered this book. Do not take anything personal. Um, the third thing is do not make assumptions. You know, sometimes as young engineers, we make assumptions that my boss doesn't think I'm good enough. You make assumptions that what are people going to think of me? Don't make assumptions, rather ask. And the last thing is to always do your best. Uh, um, and in everything that you do, work, damn hard and stay the course. I think those would be then my, my, my parting words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. That was actually so amazing. Um, I, I just made a few notes and um, 
takeaway points and, and what I just wanted to say was realize that the value you add, continue self-improvement, um, realize that sometimes we have to adapt and um, adjust and then think outside the box. And I think that was really great. So our keynote speaker and the last speaker for this session, um, please help me welcome Dr. Hao Mutsai. Dr. Mutsai is a founder of Lead of Leadership Emporium, a boutique leadership advisory and consulting firm. She's also an expert in workplace bullying. The title of her PhD is in organi organizational behavior research obtained from the University of Victoria is perceptions of bullying and organizational and antecedents in the South African workplace. Her passion for creating healthy, respectful and bully-free work environments, as well as her continued application and research in the field of workplace bullying has led her, led her led to her appointment to the board of the International, International Association on Workplace Bullying and Harassment, a global membership organization of academics, research and practitioners in the workplace bullying and harassment. Dr. Motsai is called also an ICF certified and accredited integral coach, as well as an independent non-executive director in several companies. She shares strong financial services, mining resources, and original equipment manufacturing industry experience. She also serves as a lecturer and lead facilitator for the MBA in management consulting and the global executive development program at Gibbs, as well as faculty in Gibbs, Gibbs Harvard Senior Executive Program Africa. Dr. Dr. Motsai, please enlighten us on bringing Ubuntu into the workplace. Thank you, uh, Renee. I'm going to make a request before I start. And my request is please you stay on. Um, I don't want to speak to just black boxes. So at least I can make that request of you. Um, and I'm, I'm, thank you so much for, for inviting me here. It's always nice to speak to uh, professionals, young professionals. My claim as opposed to the built environment, seeing that I'm speaking to engineers who are in the field of built environment is, my claim to that is that in my previous life, I was a town planner. So I had um, a, a few workings with, the, um, with, with engineers. And then of course I veered into uh, different things. I'm one of those people that believe in the world of end, you know, not either or. So all of my, all of the things that I've done, my studies and my experience um, is, is very different to, 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 um, to each other. So to some people it might look at being as being schizophrenic. To me, it's, you know, it's the whole, it actually speaks about what I've come to do today, um, which is a portfolio life. So I've got a few slides to share. So today I'd like to talk about humanizing the workplace. Um, humanizing the workplace is something that's very, very close to my heart. Um, and, and I believe that one of the, um, one of the advantages of, of much as, as harsh as it has, it has been and continues to be on us of the pandemic is that you know, the idea, humanizing the workplace in a, is an idea whose time I believe has come. So in the next slide, um, uh, Godfrey, um, we're going to have to dance now, Godfrey. You're going to have to sense that um, it's time for you to go to the next slide, seeing that I have no control over this. So, um, and I believe that humanizing the workplace is becoming more critical, especially in these times where we are working um, virtually. And um, more and more, some of the stories that I hear when I'm talking to people, um, I hear that it's a what I call that people are being reduced to email addresses and faces on a Zoom or Teams meeting. Um, and, and one of the things that we then need to, to be aware of is people are more than that. And the biggest form of inhumanity in organizations, something that I'd like to talk a little bit about because it's also something that I've continuously seen in organizations is workplace bullying. And, and, and I'd like to spend, there are many other areas, but today I'd like to just uh, 
uh, spend a little bit of time talking about workplace bullying, what it is, because we have to know, we have to recognize the inhumanity in organizations in order for us to change, to rehumanize the organizations. So when I pause, uh, Godfrey, it means next slide. So now let's look at the multiple faces of bullying or inhumanity in the workplace. And I believe it's important for us to know what it is in order for us to know what we're working with and what we need to change in order to uh, rehumanize the organization. The first uh, thing is how bullying in the workplace manifests itself is through physical aggression. And this is in a form of personal insults, threats, intimidation, rude interruption. For example, when somebody speaks, um, when there's almost like a, a, a specific behavior targeted at specific people, which is not the same uh, behavior that is meted out to, to other people. And um, sometimes it also comes, the physical aggression comes in the form of damning sarcastic jokes, uh, humiliation and public shaming. The other form, and, and this verbal aggression and verbal bullying are what we call overt uh, type of behavior, meaning that it's behavior that you can see, behavior, bullying behavior that you can see. As far as bullying, verbal bullying is concerned, it comes through, it manifests um, behavior such as shouting, interruption when somebody's speaking consistently. Or the one thing that I have to say uh, because there's a, there's a fine line between uh, bullying in the workplace and other forms of negative acts at work, such as harassment or intimidation. So what distinguishes uh, bullying from the others is that um, bullying happens for something to be regarded, a behavior to be regarded as bullying. It has to happen over a period of time. So there is persistence. And over a period of that time, there's also, it escalates, the behavior escalates. And um, with the escalation and with the uh, persistence of the behavior happening over a period of time, there begins to be certain patterns. There's a pattern behavior that begins to emerge. So that's one of the things, so the, these are the three major things that distinguish bullying from other negative acts at work. Um, for example, with harassment, um, for it to be harassment, it ought to happen only once, you know, harass with harassment um, happening once, um, you know, does, um, it does constitute um, harassment because it's also a phenomenon that's very well known um, compared to, uh, to bullying. We still don't talk a lot about bullying in the workplace in South Africa, which is one of the things that it's almost like my mission, my big, hairy, audacious goal of bringing humanity into the organization is actually uh, beginning to talk about what bullying is and what it looks like um, so that people can begin to recognize it when it happens and over time um, get into action around how do we deal with it and how do we eradicate it in order to uh, make our workplaces human. So verbal bullying also comes in um, name calling, ridiculing uh, people and opposing everything said, suggested or suggested by or, or done by the target. Relational aggression is one of those that is very, very tricky sometimes and nuanced um, to, to identify there because they're nuanced, they're, they're very difficult sometimes um, to identify because it comes in terms of manipulation, social manipulation aimed at damaging targets professional reputation. And what do I mean by social manipulation? Uh, social manipulation means that, you know, sometimes the, the, the perpetrators of this behavior are very sleek, um, in term, politically savvy, if you like. So in the, in the public eye or when everybody's around, sometimes they, they tend to be very caring or appear to be caring, but slandering in, in, in the, the manner in which they communicate in some of the things that they say and in the way that they manipulate their targets. 
And this often may come in terms of you know, fabrication, um, gossiping, uh, spreading untruths about the target, knowing especially where the target has no right of reply. Another way that um, the uh, bullying shows up is through mobbing or group bullying, where a group of people uh, gang against the target. Um, and in such instances, in group bullying, it's, it's often premeditated and typically uh, because the target is seen as, as posing some kind of a threat to whatever the goals and the agenda that the, the, the two people, the two bullies might be having. And it's, it's really, because it's premeditated, it's consistent um, in terms of plotting and, and the plotting is usually around putting the target um, at his or her place. Institutional bullying is when bullying is entrenched and is accepted as a way of managing people. So there's a bullying culture, you know, it's almost like the dominant uh, type of leadership is the commanding leadership style in the organization where it, before you know it, this is what most of the leaders um, and majority of the leaders lead in the organization. You went back. Godfrey. Yeah, go back to, yes. So the other uh, um, uh, phase is bullying through abuse of legal processes. And this typically take the form of a threats of laying disciplinary charges, instituting baseless um, investigation to teach target a lesson. And by the way, one of the things I, I did not mention is that what I'm sharing with you is research based from organizations in South Africa. So one of what I looked for when I was doing my research was to understand how uh, targets uh, within South Africa, South African workplace, uh, workplaces understand bullying. Although granted it was in the financial services and, and manufacturing, but these are what real people said in South Africa. Um, because one of the things, um, of course, is that there's very, very little research done on the subject in South Africa. And one of, one of the things that I'm doing um, is essentially, you know, gathering more and more applied research about this. So uh, one of the things it came, one of what people reported is that bullying comes through um, using the thread of legal processes of saying when somebody does this, your target, um, they often be uh, get threatened by, I'll take you through a disciplinary process, or they get threatened with, you know, almost like you are being insubordinate or instituting clandestine investigations around them. Um, investigations that really are meaningless, but they are really at the core is about threatening um, the, um, is about, threatening the target and inducing even more fear in them. Organizational bullying occurs when the organization, you know, especially in the, in the uh, times that we are in now, there's, um, you know, more and more organizations are expected to do more with less because of tough economic um, environment where people have been laid off and, and, and you know, that, what happens externally has a direct impact in the organization. So what happens in situations like this, where people have been laid off, it's almost like a, a question of survival of the, fifth, of, of the fittest with people jostling for positions. And if that makes um, it, this kind of environment makes it right for bullying to happen. There's a lot of backstabbing, as I said, jostling for positions during major organizational change. And what tends to happen in an organization, uh, in organizational bullying, one of the biggest, the more prominent characteristics is a blame culture or scapegoating, nobody taking accountability for, the, for their action. Pressure bullying is really, it comes in the form of undue pressure to, to perform under impossible circumstances. Um, for example, giving unrealistic timeframes and in under you know unconducive uh, conditions. So one thing that I'm going to always re repeat 
to remind you is that all these things happen over time. For them to be regarded as bullying, they happen over time, over at least a period of six months um, or more. Um, threats of insubordination, uh, insubordination where in, in, as far as pr uh, pressure bullying is concerned, where if you are given on top of what you may already have, you are given last minute urgent deliverables, but the timelines are not, um, are not um, increased. Um, so those are some of the ways in which pressure bullying uh, manifests come, come into play. Corporate bullying is when the biggest bully is the top, you know, the biggest bully is the top leader. When the top leader is a bully, naturally what happens is that the behavior, such, of such behavior um, gets emulated throughout the organization and, and it cascades throughout the organization where almost everybody takes it as this is, you know, the way, um, the way to lead. It becomes, before you know it, it becomes an accepted way of leading. Cyberbullying, I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, on it. Um, essentially, is through we're living in the in the in the times of social media, where social media is very rampant, and um, where and as far as cyberbullying is concerned, is about the use of social media and other technology platforms to intimidate, harass, humiliate. Humili uh, hu humiliate or micromanage, uh, micromanage. In all of this, there's an intention to hurt. So cyberbullying, one of the things that I've, in the work that I've been doing currently, I'm finding that it, it is on the rise and part of it is brought about by the, the advent of working virtually. And um, what I find, what I found and what I'm finding is that it shares the same similar features as what I have just described, I've shown you, except that what, what the difference is, what is unique about cyberbullying is that it happens through technology um, and, and is not face to face. Um, you know, subjects are, are subjected to perceive these perceived negative acts. They are conducted through technology particularly through um, email. One of the forms of uh, the emerging trend is bullying through emails. I was speaking to um, some of a focus group not, not too long ago, and the people were saying that it's almost like we are in, uh, expected to be online 24 seven. People eat their lunch, have their breakfast, and, and eat on, on in front of, on their chairs in front of their computers because there's, you know, there's expected, it's almost like policing where you are expected to be online all the time. So one of the emerging trends and from what I've been gathering is that emails, you know, through bullying comes through emails with un unreasonable, unreasonable expectations, expectations to be online all the time Again, delegation of work to be done with unreason unreasonable timelines. But the biggest one, which, which was quite interesting, was the, you know, the, the email, sending an email, especially whether it's uh, demeaning or somebody is, you know, is being called to order and copying a million of people who have got nothing to do with the, um, with the issue at hand and sometimes even blind copying um, other people. And in instances where there's, you know, copying of a lot of people and unblind, uh, you know, blind copying, you're not even aware, the target is not even aware the extent to which the, um, the reach, uh, how many people have actually um, um, been witness to what is happening on. So the, the um, again, surprise, surprise, I don't think anybody's surprised, technology enables information to reach a broader audience lightning fast. You know, once you hit that send, that hit, it's gone, and it can actually be forwarded. And before you know it, it, it actually can, you know, it has reached a whole lot of people as opposed to when, for example, it was happening in the office. 
And I made an example about blind copying where, you know, essentially it renders the extent and reach of the abuse faceless um, because you don't know the extent to which the reach um, has been. So it, it's essentially, there's no place to hide and to hide and abuse can, can be relentless and can carry on 24 seven. Um, some of the, what, what organizations use now and for good reason, because we are working from home, different teams and have, have, we now have WhatsApp groups all over the place. Again, that's also another platform which has, which has been um, I'm finding in some of the conversations I've been having with, with people at work and with some of my clients um, where targets are saying that the abuse also happens there. So I, I shared with you all that um, just to show you what an inhumane workplace looks like. And, um, and, and, and also for you to, to make sense, hopefully to help you to make sense of some of the things that you might be seeing, but also, but most importantly, because you're young professionals and I believe that some of you have got your own businesses, um, it's more around be aware of these things. And one of the things that I'm also finding out is because everybody's under pressure, uh, some people are not even aware that for, for one, what is happening to them is bullying, and two, what they may be doing and be engaged in is, um, is actually bullying. So there's a responsibility on leaders, uh, first and foremost, but also on ourselves as, as employees to, to understand what behavior is um, essentially renders the um, organizations inhumane. So um, uh, now I believe that there's an opportunity for us with a little information and being having access to the information that I've shared to take it upon ourselves to humanize the workplace. And we can do that through empathy, courage, and values-based um, leadership. So first, why do we need to humanity in the workplace? Um, um, one of the things, and I refer to it, is that there's been the collapse of personal and professional boundaries highlighted actually the need to understand that people are not just email addresses or faces on, on platforms like the one we, we're using today. Therefore, there's a need to support employees holistically to understand that you know, individuals, employees are whole beings. And because for, for some, um, one of the things that it being uh, Women's Month also, one of the, the um, what this has highlighted is that the, um, the merging of the personal and professional boundaries have actually impacted, you know, impact people differently and women also differently. Um, so um, instead of asking for a meeting at seven o'clock, you know, uh, typically uh, in, in before the lockdowns and before working virtually, people would have to go drop the children, first drop the children off at, at work, at, at school before they go to work. So some of the people that have been the focus groups I've been talking to were saying that we now starting meetings at seven. Um, 7 a.m. Why the meetings at seven? Because we still we have children. We have to take care of children. We have to bath children, breakfast, and and all that. So that that then part of why we need humanity and to bring back humanity into the workplace is first by recognizing that employees are holistic being with different results. So it's the need to support them. Um, holistically, there's a need for, for empathy, but also boundaries, importantly boundaries. The fact that we're working from home and we, we, there's more access does not mean in order to be healthy and to create healthy workplaces, even working uh, remotely, is to have boundaries. I often make the joke that we, not, we should not even call it uh, working from home, 
we should call it living at work. And because we're living at work, there is, this is why there's even more a need for boundaries, boundaries to say, now I'm at work, now I'm at home. Because otherwise, before you, you know it, the two speakers before me spoke about um, uh, work-life balance. That's why work-life balance is actually so elusive right now. And it has been even being made more difficult by the uh, personal and prof professional boundaries, you know, having, having merged, so to speak. So there's also the collapse of these has also uh, brought a need to bring our whole selves to work. You know, our whole selves, we are not just employees, we've got other responsibilities. We are this, we are mothers, we are sisters, we are husbands, we are wives, we are partners, we are every, whatever, all those other things. Um, so it's the most, it's important therefore to recognize that we are whole beings. Um, and, and, and therefore need different support or need to create boundaries. What this, um, why do we need this? Um, it shows that there's a, almost like need for a more human centric work. All, everything that I've, said, I've spoken about speaks to the need for human centric work. And um, again, my, my two speakers before me speak about work-life balance. I speak about work-life harmony um, because talking about balance, at least in my view, is uh, you know almost like presupposes that you are able to manage them equally in a balanced way. For me, um, I call it work-life harmony, and what what how I define work-life harmony is with boundaries um, is, for example, when I'm at the desk at a certain time, I'm fully there. Everything that I'm doing, if I'm at work, I'm fully there, 100%. When I'm at home, even though I'm home, you know, work is home, I am fully there. So I, I'm, I work in such a way that, um, you know, certain boundaries, I have a hard lock unless there's always going to be um, an exception, especially because most of us, all of us are, are entrepreneurs, that are always have a hard lockdown to say, I, I don't work beyond this time. And, and when, I'm, when that time happens, then I'm fully home and with everything that is at fully home. So that's, that for me is, uh, is harmony, work-life harmony, because sometimes, you're going to find, and there's going to be a need for you to be almost out of balance a little bit uh, in terms of work. I mean, a few weeks ago, I was a few months actually for, for a few months, kind of hard at work project all the time. And I, I knew that I needed to do that, but I knew that they were buying me uh, in future, in you know, time to come. They, doing what I was doing was going to buy me time off, you know? So that's that, in my view, um, I strive for work-life harmony. And, and the principle really being that everywhere I am, I am there fully, but I'm able to do that by putting in place hard boundaries. So what are the leadership um, implications uh, to creating this humanity at work? is about listening more to employees' different needs because different employees, we are all at different places, to different employees based on the things that I've said earlier have got different needs. And it, in order for us to be able to do that, we've got to recognize our personal life circumstances, not just our professional lives. And this doesn't mean you know, being nosy, um, getting into people's businesses, but it's more around understanding who, you know, what, what might be the personal circumstances that the person might be dealing with um, in order for me to, to support more. This is leadership with caring. Remember one of, I believe um, leadership is about, you know, is about caring. If you, as a leader, you care about your employees, 
they uh, when they feel respected, when they feel that they matter, you know, it actually studies have also shown that 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 has a direct and positive uh, impact on on the productivity. Humanize performance management processes and encourage collaboration. This I could speak about it, you know, for a long time. But what we do in organizations, we often talk about teamwork. Teamwork, for example, is one of many of our of our values. Yet we reward individual performance. Um, so perhaps what I'm saying, I'm advocating is um, in terms of you know creating humanizing workplaces is around collaborating, uh, encouraging collaborating. Uh, collaboration, which means looking at taking a relook at our performance management processes. So the other thing is that the future of work is here. Everybody talks about the future of work as if it's something that's still coming that's going to happen. It is my assertion that the future of work is here. Therefore, we need to relook in order to create the kind of environments that are humane. We need to relook uh, at our old ways of doing things, create an environment. One of the ways that we could do that is create an environment for genuine feedback, build to build psychological safety. Psychological safety is another concept that is being spoken about um, lately, but essentially it, it really speaks to where employees feel free to voice their opinion, to provide feedback, without fear of, of um, intimidation or, or, or any backlash. So humanity at work is the foundation for psychology, psychological safety and a healthy company culture. So let's now look at the leadership implications for humanizing the, the workplace. You know, just caring from what I, what I said earlier, what does it then mean? for leaders uh, personally, because leaders have got a responsibility um, in creating this humane workplace. Um, it's, it's about really caring and investing and in, in understanding and, at, and attending to your employees' fe fears and emotions and understanding both not just their professional lives or circumstances, but their personal circumstances, as I said, and it also means that, you know, for, for you as a leader to be able to do that, you have to open yourself to being vulnerable. Um, and, and there's uh, part of being, you know, being vulnerable means, you know, um, means admitting, for example, taking accountability and, and admitting your, and owning your own mistakes and apologizing if you've made the mistakes and making things right. And most importantly, we also talk about the point I forgot to mention that is stress is that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And this is the gist of the leader that is important, that is critical for creating a, a humane environment, workplace. The important thing about, um, about leaders um, that's critical for them humanizing the workplace is their leadership style. And I values-based leadership is at the core of it. And what that means is having clarity on your own core values. Um, what essentially is, it's more around what do I care about? What guides how I behave? What guides how I lead? What is my North Star? And you cannot be able to, to lead in a values-based way if your values are not clear and crystal to you. Um, in other words, what are your, I usually say that, you know, if you have more than three, I'm one of those who believes in the power of three. If you have more than three core values, then you it's almost like you're as good as having no values. So what are your three most important values um, which shape and which are shaped by the beliefs that are most dear and close to your heart and, and fill you with a sense of purpose? So when I work, usually when I work with leaders, you know, in and in terms of um, you know, creating their 
enhancing their values based leadership. I work with them uh, to us translate and help them translate their values into behaviors. I think we all know in organizations, the, we have values that are on the plugs and have the time, but the behaviors do not match what, the, um, what is on the plugs in the, in the world. So one simple exercise uh, process that I use is to work with leaders to help them identify what their core values are. And, and once we have identified, they've identified their values, and then we then work with them to identify three behaviors that support our values. Because there's one thing to have a value, the value is best described and lived in the behavior, how you behave daily, consistently. And then um, what, what, the, what I typically then ask is what are the three behaviors that often trip you? Um, and make you behave outside of your outside of your values, and and um, ask the question. The last question I ask is then, what is the example of the time when we, you were fully living this value to help them understand and almost like work out over time, wiring, um, you know, whatever it is, the practices, what was real for them there. To almost like wire it in, in your mind's eye so that you remember you behave, uh, remember always to behave in a certain way um, to, live, to live your values. Most important thing, lastly, I think this is the last slide, is your support. Who is your support, your network of support? Um, I think also Refilo, the, the second Refilo also spoke about the importance of networking. I would add also to add who are your real support? Who um, and by support I don't mean people that are always going to be. I don't all. I don't mean people that are yes people all the time. I also mean that pe people that are going to tell you the truth when they need to tell you the truth when they see you behaving in the way that is outside of your um, outside of your your values. The last thing, um, something that I do in terms of my network of support, I have this concept that I've, I've read about and I've instituted in my life. I have a, a, a board of directors, my own individual board of directors. These are people that I trust and from different parts of um, in my life and all they have different qualities and I trust them. Essentially, they're my thinking partners. So every time I need um, advice or I need to um, you know, bounce an idea against, these are the people I would go to. So um, in closing, um, the future of work is here. We, we speak about the future of work, but the, actually the future of work is here. And this future of work really demands a human-centric uh, behaviors, making us leaders and organization looking and understanding that, you know, uh, employees are not just cogs in the machine. Um, they are, you, they are more than, as I said, my starting point was they are more than just email addresses and pictures or boxes in, in Zoom or Teams meeting. They have real hopes and fears. Humanizing the workplace is a, is a precursor to creating psychological safety and leaders are at the core of it. Um, I really do believe one of my principles, I believe that leadership is an expression of who we are and what values uh, matter most to us. So what therefore that means is we have to start by you know, mastering and investing in ourselves as leaders and understanding who we are um, in order for us to be able to create the kind of environments and workplaces where people can flourish. Uh, uh, but lastly, I believe it takes courage to lead with humility and vulnerability and that workplace bullying is a threat to humane places, which is why I started um, with it to describe what an inhumane workplace looks like, which is not what we want. 
we need to, in order for us to rehumanize and humanize our workplaces, these are the things that we need to be aware of and we need to do. Thank you. I think this is the last slide. And thank you, uh, Godfrey, for coming to my rescue when my functionalities went astray. So I'm happy to take comments and questions. Can I? Um, I, I can take comments and questions. You can stop sharing now, Godfrey. So thank you for that, um, Doctor. It was amazing. Um, the thing that <laughs> that I found um, well, the thing that was quite funny for me was not work from home, but living at work, which is so relevant because like you expressed, everything merges into one um, working from home. You end up working such long hours and then you realize, oh my word, um, it's time to move away from the computer. And it was so funny also because generally we eat lunch and uh, breakfast in front of your computer because you always have to be there. Um, so now we're going to open the floor to comments and questions. Um, can I ask that the two refillers also um, just pop up the video so that if there are questions um, posed to them, then we can all um, take it. There's a question from Esther saying, how do we handle favoritism at work, at the workplace, not, not quite bullying? Um, you know, the, the, um, the, there's, there's a fine line really uh, between favoritism and, and bullying. Perhaps it's not bullying because um, there's nothing malicious or negative behavior targeted at you. But um, one where I say it might also, you know, there might be a fine line because one of the bullying behaviors is making people in, invisible, making people feel invisible, um, where, you know, you either ignore them or you don't give them the, the consistent airtime, um, you know, compared to the others. So, um, the, the only way you can deal with it, Esther, if it is possible, is actually to raise it um, with, with either your line manager or your HR. Half the time, it I know it becomes difficult because um, if, if in the event that you know, it is your line manager that is practicing favoritism around um, towards others. So in the, the one thing that comes to mind is that you know, what recourse do you have in organizations? Are there processes where you can raise certain things? Um, safety, safely, if not, who else can you talk to perhaps to get advice from? Because um, it's, it's actually quite complex. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question in our question and answers. Um, Function where Uzaid asks, Do you find bullying happens often at the workplace, and how does a young professional handle this once it's been identified? If it's an individual transgress transgressor or a culture? Um, Uzaid, the, um, I'm finding that it actually one of the things that um, um, bullying is on the rise actually in the South African workplace. Um, and the two refillers um, also, even though it's a subject that you are not talking about, but you, I'm, I'd also be happy for you to make your comments. Bullying is on the rise and in South African workplaces, but the, the problem is that there's low level of awareness. It's not spoken about. And even when these kinds of behavior happens consistently, um, it's being suppressed, nobody, and the intention, what usually happens is that even those brave people that speak up, um, the tendency is to actually uh, support or to align with the perpetrator, um, with the bully. And often what makes it difficult is that there's always a power imbalance, some form of power imbalance in, in bullying situation in the sense that, you know, it's manager, 
subordinate. So they, they tend to have a little bit more power or power over you. So what I do when I work with organizations, we've created a process, a self-assessment where um, in the, if the individual is, you know, um, thinks they are bullied, there are certain things that we ask them to do, you know, create a, a simple self-assessment with specific uh, behaviors that constitute bullying and for them to essentially uh, record and keep record of what is going on. If it's through the emails, also keep records of those because they might help you um, for recourse. Because why we do that also is that, um, is, is also to safeguard you because the last thing you want to do is to accuse somebody of bullying and, and it turned out it may not necessarily be bullying. So that's one of the things that, that um, you know, I request the, the targets or people that suspect to be bullied to do that. But uh, what I also do is work with leaders and organizations to define for themselves what bullying is and to help them create bullying policies and procedures through which people, which people could use to report instances of bullying. I hope it answers your question, uh, Uze. What if your company genuinely cannot hire more people and you have to work 50 hours with? with them? Well, uh, Shilpi, that, that question is that, um, your question really is that there are circumstances. So if there are, um, there's a conversation and there's an agreement and there's a clear terms of engagement as to why, you have to take on the biggest load. You have to work 50 hours uh, per, 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 uh, per week. If it is agreed and, and, and typically understandably, it's more around uh, we doing this in order for us to be able to cross over, to cross the bridge, then it's something else. It's very different when um, to when those expectations um, you know, uh, are not cleared up front and there's inconsistent um, you know, request for un during in, within tight timelines, unreasonable requests and with, with you know, um, if that was not cleared up front, there's a difference if the terms of engagement and the contractual agreements and the arrangements were done up front. Um, which is very, very different to some of the behaviors that are described. I hope it answers your question. Doctor, there's another question um, in the chat function, which I think relates closely to um, Shilpi's question. How do we handle workload bullying in a work environment where you work under different bosses or where you are, where you are studying on the side, but the boss is not understanding? Okay, I'm trying to see where they, how do you work, handle uh, Look, I mean, some of those, um, as uh, your question uh, and Divo, again, it's more a question of, some of it is just poor management. You know, sometimes we, what happens in organizations is, because somebody is very good in that job and they're a specialist and they get promoted to being a manager without necessarily being given the tools and support to develop to be a good, uh, a good manager. Some of the question that you're saying um, that Ndivo is asking really should be a function of, you should be able, first of all, there should be policies in your organization, especially because you're talking about studying there should be a study uh, policies which, may, which say you can take away the amount of, you can take leave or this or that or the other. Um, so some of those things, it's a function of probably weak processes within your organization, but there should be uh, processes, HR processes typically, which, which, you could, um, which you could use to try to solve, to solve that. If it doesn't, it's, that's not a question I can answer fully at this point, but it's, um, it, it really is a matter of either your internal HR processes and because you're saying that you, you're working for multiple bosses, it's around 
managing through expectations. You know, are there uh, are your KPIs clarified upfront? If not, perhaps that might be something that you might start with in terms of, you know, what am I expected to do? What are the KPIs? What does success look like? And commit and contract with them around that. I hope it answers your question, Devo. Um, then we have um, another question from Gert. Um, on institutional bullying, how do you deal? How does one deal with rules being created? Could almost be seen as a threat, especially because of COVID, of the COVID pandemic. While the MD handles HR matters as well. Also, do you have any tips on how to handle matters when the company does not keep the policies of keep to the policy of an employee's contract? So, so, so the the tip that the only tip I have is also what I what I have said. Um, again, this was uh, done something that I usually do over over a period. Um, I've done in in forty minutes or so, but um, the the only tip and and I'm happy to to share. Um, I don't know if I have, no, I don't have it. The the tip I have is, as I said, I usually have a small uh, table, some of the things that I've developed to help people uh, take record, make record, um, and, and because that might be your only recourse, particularly because often you are threatened with legal processes or where you are pushed out of the organization. So what you might, the only recourse, one of the most important recourse you might have is what, uh, what proof do you have? Think like an auditor when, when bullying is happening to you, it's more around, you know, essentially documenting and keeping records of, of all those behavior. And then of course, the next thing would be based on your policies, and, and it's difficult. I mean, I can, uh, the person that asked the question, it's difficult when the MD and is, is the HR person at the same time, you know? And, and this is also the, the unfairness of, of this phenomenon. Um, and in that case, the only recourse you have might be externally. Um, you know, if it become, if it comes to that and becomes unbearable, especially because your MD is also acting as the HR director. Okay. Um, we have, the question. We have a question from, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Niyasha the questions are very, <laughs> very long. I have to say, <laughs> I have to read them very long. So <laughs> that would help, but I mean, I do understand this is an emotive subject. So um, um, some nine managers or project leaders, when you try to set boundaries, they interpret as unwillingness to work or go above and beyond another ceiling. Minara or three experiences the current situation presentation. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, uh, Rafila and Rafila. This one can can you take it? Can you? Because there's also about in uh, panelists, all three experience has the current situation post additional stresses on clients and professionals such that empathy is being suppressed. Is is it we are progressing but not equipped with the necessary skills as we arise? Not everyone is a leader, hence the bullying. Um, if 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 Rafila can take the, that question, uh, I just wanted to you know and give my input on you know Shilpi's question because um, I think that's so close to me because that's something that we've you know recently went through as a company you know regarding um, if you cannot hire more people and uh, you have to work more hours without more pay and so forth. So uh, because of COVID, as as a small business owner, we've we've we went through we've experienced that. You know, with you know decreasing sales and um, things just not looking positive. And what I've learned as a you know as a business owner, you know, is that it's critical to you know to you know to to put your your team into your confidence, mm -hmm. right? And just to let them know, like guys, this is the this is what's happening now. 
um, it's not looking good. And based on the work, you can see that things are not you know, picking up as planned. And then this is my proposal, you know? And, and secondly, um, also get their inputs with regards to how um, uh, uh, we can over time, uh, we can overcome this, this tough period, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so I just wanted to, you know, just, just to hit on that one. And, um, and that's become, you know, very effective. So, so essentially just communicating effectively and uh, making the team aware of what's happening. That's, uh, thanks for that, um, for that example, Rufilo, because that's what uh, real leaders do. Um, and not actually throwing everything and blaming and, and essentially grinding the people. Because part of, part of what I'm talking about is that, because often people also hide behind, I'm not a bully, I'm managing performance, tough management. And I always make a distinction. There's a difference between bullying and tough management. You can still be tough and not tolerate, tolerate subpar performance but it's in the how, and is it fair, and is it consistent with how you, you treat others? So that's a very, very good point of, of even, because one of the things that I spoke about is part of humanizing is, is actually what you, what you talked about, taking employees into, the, into your confidence and having the tough conversations. And some of those tough conversation might be, I have to let you, let you go. This is also when it's your values are also quite important. Even when you let people, you know, go when, when you fire them, but it's more the how and with that dignity intact, you know, and, and, and so on. So that, thanks for that um, input, Rufilu. So, um, Employers and managers tend to relate more with stuff than performance and How do you relate this to? Um, I am um, akin. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, in my own view, it's, it's not a favoritism, but, um, and I'll give you personal example. I like giving personal real examples. In my previous life, when I was an executive, there were, I had a group of people reporting to me and the way I managed them was different, you know, based on there was one, one person who was a high performer. I later learned actually, um, um, my, I had a PA who was an Africana lady and she said to me, they say, so-and-so is your vet brewerki. And I'm like, what is vet brewerki? So it's like, you, you, you favor, you, you always, essentially I was accused of favoring that person. But what happened was that that person and the way I did with all my direct reports, we contracted on, you know, on, on the expectations on, we had conversations about what does good look like? How do we uh, communicate and so on? But without failure, every time I had you know, he, she was consistently performing. So even when there were problems, what do you do as a, as a manager, as a leader? And, you know, she did one or two uh, um, issues and I took the fall for her as her manager because I gave her, you know, you delegate responsibility and you support but ultimately you take the, you know, as the ultimate uh, manager leader, you take the fall when, when the person, um, you know, did, made a mistake because mistakes do happen. And that may be perceived as, um, as favoritism. And then there was um, somebody else who was brilliant, spoke the language, spoke everything, but it never translated into, into performance, into real, uh, um, you know, um, tangible performance. The way I managed that person was different in the sense that we had much more, um, and I always use this example, micromanagement is, is, is not necessarily a bad thing because some people need to be, might need to be managed closely. The only thing is in the how, 
So the, the perception might be there, what you can do as a leader is to try to be consistent in how you manage and lead people uh, that report to you, even though you manage and lead them direct, uh, differently. The central thing, at least for me, has always been, am I being fair? Am I being consistent? Even if it means it may translate differently to different people, but the question is, am I being fair? I hope it answers your question and, um, okay. Okay, this, okay um, great. Um, if you feel way put lazy, just um, on the previous question, if you can maybe weigh in with um, the current, um, in, in our panelists' experience, has the current situation posed additional stresses on clients and professionals such that empathy is being suppressed? Do you feel where you are on mute? Um, <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, I, you know, this this is one of those questions where, and 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 Dr. Ngao also mentioned that sometimes as a manager, you are also under pressure, right? And it 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 becomes such a gray area for you, uh, um, um, as as a manager who also needs to deliver, that you 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 cross the line and you 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 almost now lose sight of, of that, of empathizing with your own team. Uh, I like what Rufilo also mentioned about the transparency aspect, um, but I think what, what, what worked for me, um, and as a female, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> sorry, I found that I often had to explain myself to my manager. So I've got four kids, and, and, and one of the things that weigh in on me is what, perception is my manager going to think when I have to go on maternity leave? You know, if I'm pregnant again, what is he going to think? So I was making that considered effort to sit down with him and say, you know, boss, this is where you want to go. I understand your vision. Uh, and in me delivering, I also have my own personal goals. And one of which is in the next three years, I'm going to, I plan on doing one, two, three, and the other. That does not mean that I will not perform. And he also then had to understand that I'm not bound by where I'm working. I will deliver. That doesn't mean that he needs to make sure that my office is open from seven to four. So so, so it, it, it had to be established through the manager engaging with me as his subordinate. I later did the same with my team whereby I have a team of six people, they're not all uh, skilled the same way, their competencies are not all the same. And I have to understand how I delegate. So you'd find there's two or more people that I would delegate in one simple line and a deadline, and I would get exactly what I'm looking for. But there are those that I need to break it down into tasks and give it to them and say, this is what I want at the end of the day, go ahead and do it. But then there are those that I have to take that task and actually split it even further to say, in this task, can you deliver this first? Once you're done with this, I'd give you the next thing. So for me, it's really a relationship between the, the manager and, and, the, and the subordinate. But what is important is to remember to be empathetic. So that is a conscious decision that I have to make because just as much as I'm a mother, I'm a wife, uh, I'm a sister, so are my subordinates. And, and together, we need to also then understand with all of these dynamics in our life, with all this work-life balance, we still work for rainwater and we have to deliver. So how do we then shape and form that and ensuring that we still perform? So it's really a relationship that one has to build um, um, to ensure that you, you get there as a team. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another question for Dr. Ngao. Um, the Niyasha Sibanda asked, um, with the future work being with the future of work being here and working from home, how can employers keep track of work progress without policing the employees through their webcam? Oh, um, uh, yeah, that that's 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 an. Um 
an interesting one. Um, I'm going to build on what Rufilo has just said previously. And, and my simple answer to that, I've coined the, the, the phrase, in this period, to answer your question, yes, we need macro managers, not micro managers. And the difference for me is that macro managers are people that, um, people like Rufilo Lidija, what, what Rufilo Lidija said, is actually a very good example of what macro managers are. It's essentially saying, this is what the situation is. You are aware this is what is happening. Uh, sales are not happening. Um, you know, everything is squeezed. Business is not doing great. Um, this is what I'm doing as the owner and leader to try for us to survive this period, to ride this. And this is what I require from you, I need for you, but you enroll them. Um, and, and, and so that at any point, there should be no surprises. So macro managers for me are people that actually help take what is happening externally, the real external world, and help you interpret and make meaning and say, this is what it means for us. Um, and this is what I expect from you. And it's more around contracting to the point that uh, Rufilo Butelis said earlier, it's more around contracting around, um, around expectations and deliverables. But unfortunately that requires maturity, professional maturity. And unfortunately people that managers that are bullies do not have that mature, uh, professional maturity. Um, that's how we should work in real life. Unfortunately, that's not always how it works, especially for leaders who are really not leaders or not managers. And this is why the specific interventions where you need um, in the work that I do, I work with people like that, um, you know, to, to, because some of them genuinely are not aware. They think they are really managing performance. But once they become aware, some of them, there's almost like, oh my word, I was not aware I'm doing this. And they're open you know, to, to being supported to shift their behavior, whether through coaching and some other interventions. Others are like, you know, um, this is the way I am. Take it, you know, take it. And, and in those instances, it's a matter of, you know, having different conversations because otherwise, um, even if that person is a performer, it's not sustainable to get, you know, to perform, to get people to perform in this way. It's, it's not as sustainable. So Nyasa, I hope it helps. It, it raised, it answers your questions. And then we just have two more questions. Um, one from Amanda, who um, is asking, stemming from yesterday's session on inequality, um, to, do, to Dr. Mutsai, how do we handle unequal pay for the same work having similar qualifications? If I know I'm getting paid less, what approach can I use to address this? Well, that's a, this is a different uh, question altogether um, about unequal pay. But typically, fortunately, in my previous life, I was in a, a, an, an HR director. So, but I mean, in, in those kinds of things, there's, there's usually every organization, again, I'm talking about organi proper organizations that are functioning as well as they should, there should be a remuneration philosophy and, and, and the remuneration philosophy, which says uh, we pay above this by certain and part of the philosophy might be, there should, there should be an allowable range. Uh, of percentages, you should be within these percentages. Uh, because the reality is that you're never going to earn exactly the same, even if you do the exact same job, because you might have different qualification or you might have different experiences. And you, it's also around where you came in. And I've never been a, a, a fan of you know, when you get hired to say, what did you show me your last jobs pay slip? 
um, and, and taking it from there. It should be more around what does the job entail? What is the expectation? And in terms of the profiling, where does it sit as far as uh, remuneration is concerned? So, um, so, so, <laughs> so I got distracted by this big yes. <laughs> so I hope it answers your question. You're never really going to um, an exact up to the T, the rand and the last cent, but there are acceptable gaps and they should not uh, tread on, on equality. Um, uh, inequality. Okay. I hope that answers the question. I think by the response, <laughs> I think that it has. Okay. But um, just in closing, can we hear from each of our speakers um, about what motivates you in life? That was one of the questions, and I thought it would be nice if we could just close up the session with each of you giving us um, a little bit of what motivates you in life. Right, I, I can just go first, uh, Ine, um, and, and if, okay. if I can just package that with um, Amanda's question, if you don't mind, right? Um, you know, um, with regards to qualifications and, and pay, um, I've, I've always viewed, um, you know, contribution and, um, um, and, and, and value, you know, even higher. And I mean, look, I might be speaking from a small SMME point of view, but uh, for me, when you know, um, I have those discussions with with my team, it's always around, um, um, you know, the, the level of contribution they're making to the team and um, and uh, and the, the the value they're bringing to the team, right? Um, and and not necessarily um, the you know the level of qualification because you need to work with business business demands and business needs. So, so I just wanted to make that input, but yeah, um, what what motivates me? You know, I've I've always um, you know uh, you know been an entrepreneur. I always loved um, that space. So my life, you know, for the past couple of years have always been structured around that. So, uh, what gives me what keeps me going professionally is really you know setting up new teams, uh, you know, going for new initiatives and just you know growing uh, businesses that can make it different and uh, you know also absorb. You know, uh, um, you know, uh, people that, that that are looking for work. So that for for, for me, that's been the the, the biggest motivator, and uh, that's been my anchor professionally for the past couple of years. Thank you, Marifilwe. Um, Marifilwe, um, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for that question. Um, the first thing that what to make that motivates me is is making sure that, that I, I add value in anything that I do. Uh, I must be able to 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 feel that I have added value. Um, um, the second thing is uh, uh, empowering others, particularly women. Um, in the spaces that I work in, I ensure that as I arise, I lift others, um, mm -hmm. and, and it's very important to me to do that. Um, uh, particularly because I mean, I've got four girls of my own, so mm -hmm. I need to make sure that as as I'm I'm, I'm rising, I'm lifting others. Um, um, and, and then the, the last thing is, you know, I spoke about unboxing yourself. So, so having the dreams and knowing that with hard work, uh, uh, you can attain them. Um, um, that is a huge motivation aspect for me. And, and if you're looking at the South African economy, um, um, wanting to add value in that and not just being a tenderpreneur, but being in the value chain that provides something that 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 is sustainable that is consistent is something that uh, uh, i'm still working towards but it, i'm motivated to ensuring that i add value into the economy of this country and transforming that so that is that is in a nutshell um, um what motivates me to keep going thanks thank you thank you so much so That's many it. things motivate me <laughs> but uppermost um from from professionally is independence. I'm one of those people that have always been so scared to depend on getting a paycheck, getting, you know, getting paid on a certain day, on a certain day every month. Because I think I learned very early on that, you know, you, 
you when you when you and I and I'm not advocating for any reason that you guys quit your jobs because if you're not wired that way, but I've always been motivated by by being in control of of my own life, you know, being the captain of my own life, so to speak. And I, sus I subscribe to the notion that each one of us, um, I take myself, always take taking myself as a company, that I'm Ngaomote Inc. and I'm the CEO. If I'm the CEO of Ngaomote Inc., then what is my vision? What is my purpose? So that's, that has always been what motivated me. And having clarity around what I really, what matters for me. If, if I felt that my life would be, if I could have the kind of life I wanted, I would say I'm fulfilled, what would it look like? Um, so I look, and that's what landed me to do what I'm doing, um, a portfolio life, doing things that I really love, that I'm passionate about but also doing things that contribute like everybody else. You know, everything that I'm doing, there's always a contribution around how do I contribute to make, you know, others um, lives better. And professionally, it also led my, to my vision, my BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal of bringing humanity back into organizations because I believe that work doesn't have to be painful. We spend a lot, so many hours at work. It doesn't have to be painful. And, and it, I've seen so much toxicity and continue to see it in organizations. And this is why I do what I do. Because when people feel um, worthy, when people feel that they, you know, they're being cared for, then they're happier. And actually they give of themselves more. And, and productivity you actually gain as an owner or a leader. So, so those are the things that, that drive me and motivate me. I really would love to see humanity in, in organizations. And this is any opportunity I have, I would speak about workplace bullying and raise awareness around it and how it's eroding. Um, not just individuals, but even organizations. And the thing is we can do better. And that's what I do to try to make organizations better. And, and I chose organizations because people spend so much time of their life at work. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the three panelists. Um, you guys have really given us some amazing insight. And I'm sure everybody that has joined us for today's session is really appreciative of all the tips and things that have been shared here this, this, this morning. <laughs> um, and if, I, if there are no further comments, I think we will bring the session to a close.